Okay, so now I'm going to teach you how to figure out what segment you're at. You're going to see just a cross section of the spinal cord and you're going to know what level it comes from. How, one of the big ways in which you're going to, you're going to figure this out is, is what we touched on at the very end of the last video, which is that in the ventral horn, this is the dorsal horn, this is the ventral horn, sensory motor, in the ventral horn, the motor neurons that innervate axial muscles are located medially and those that innervate appendicular and progressively more distal musculature are um, innervated, or, I'm sorry, are situated more laterally. So if you have a lateral extension to the ventral horn, you cannot be in thoracic cord. Okay, great. So let's meet the various uh, appearances. This is, uh, th these are sections that are not to scale and, and I apologize for that. Um, uh, the cervical cord is, is the largest. It is very large in us. So uh, once again, these are stained for myelin. So white matter is blue and gray matter is uh, relatively light, sort of a light, light blue to white. Um, so the cervical uh, spinal cord, there's this large uh, extension, uh, lateral extension to the ventral horn. And then compare it to the thoracic cord where there's just this tiny little tidbit here. Can we zoom in on that? So you see there is a very, there's no lateral extension. Here in the, in the lumbar cord, there's a lateral extension and also even in the, in the sacral cord. So this is serving the feet. This big thing here is serving the hands and this thoracic cord's got no limb to serve, so it's a paltry little skinny thing that has no lateral extension. So that's one thing. If you have a lateral extension, you're either in cervical or lumbosacral. Let's, let's look at another feature. This little outpouching, I introduced it last time as the intermedial lateral cell column. Yes, that's a mouthful, or IML the intermedial lateral cell column. Another, another name for it is the lateral horn. And this contains the preganglionics of the thoracic cord. And it is very obvious. It is not present in the cervical cord. It is not present in the lumbar cord or even in the sacral cord. In the sacral cord, this collection up here is our, our preganglionics, preganglionic autonomic neurons. They're going to go to the ganglia that are going to then in turn innervate the bladder colon and, and um, genitalia. So remember that there's a, there, the, there's a basal plate, the, the ventral half of the spinal cord derives from the basal plate and is motor with the dorsal pie slice of that ventral half being autonomic and the ventral pie slice being uh, skeletal motor. Okay, so these are um, sympathetic preganglionics. These are sympathetic preganglionics. There are not sympathetic preganglionics in either the lumbar cord or the cervical cord. The next thing that we can uh, use is the amount of white matter. So everything has to come down from the brain or go up to the brain through the cervical cord. So all the fibers pass through the cervical cord, but only a minority of them pass through the, through the sacral cord. So the white to gray matter ratio is largest in the cervical cord and smallest, and it gets progressively smaller, and it's smallest in the sacral cord. And we can see that. Look at all the white matter. Look at all the white matter surrounding the gray uh, matter in the cervical cord. And in comparison, look at the relatively little bit of white matter in, uh, in sacral cord. And this looks to me as though it's around S1. By the time you get even back to S3 or S4, it's going to be uh, much less even than that. So there's, there's really uh, a reduction in the amount of um, white matter as you go progressively uh, more caudal through the spinal cord. There are other features. Um, so the ovaloid shape of the cervical cord is, is quite uh, distinctive. The, um, 
the square shape of the lumbar cord, the round uh, sort of almost teardrop shape of the sacral cord, and the round shape of the thoracic cord. These are all somewhat distinctive. Another one is that in combination with the fact that there is a lateral extension wherever you have a limb, um, but not where you just have the trunk, the amount of space taken up by the dorsal horn differs acro across the the um, uh, across the spinal cord segments. So, for example, we have a lot more sensory information coming in from our our hands than we do from a, the same amount of skin in our trunk. In fact, there's virtually there's very very little. And so, what you have in the in the trunk are these tiny little dorsal horns, these spindly little dorsal horns compared to the, the, um, a much larger dorsal horn in the cervical, lumbar, and, and sacral uh, segments. The final thing that I want to point out is that remember that the dorsal column medial lemniscal pathway carries light touch, vibration, and proprioception. And it carries it in through the dorsal root. It then goes shooting up the dorsal columns. Well, those dorsal columns at, in sacral levels, they're at sacral levels, the dorsal columns only carry information from the back of the legs. And at lumbar levels, they start to get information from the front of the legs and from the hips. And then once you get to thoracic levels, you start to get information from the trunk. And it's cervical. So as you march along, you're getting more and more information. And look at this. So here's sacral cord. There's just a little bit of, of dorsal column. Whereas at, at cervical levels, there's this great expanse. The, the, at this point, um, there is even a division between the uh, area that is carrying information from the lower limb and from the upper limb. So more medially, what we have is uh, the, the um, axons coming from the lower limb. This is called fasciculus gracilis. And then the axons coming from the upper limb, that's fasciculus cuneatus. And so you can see that there are basically a, uh, two different chimneys or two different funiculi of, of white matter in the cervical cord, but only one at sacral, lumbar, and uh, at sacral and lumbar levels. And then in thoracic levels, you're starting to get the second one. Okay, so let's make sure that we understand um, where everything is, is traveling. Remember, we have our three big pathways. And so the, the first one that we're gonna talk about is the, we're gonna reiterate, I'm gonna reiterate what happens with the dorsal column medial lemniscus pathway. The dorsal columns are, are everything here. And this would be a section from cervical cord. It has uh, the fasciculus gracilis, uh, which carries information about light touch, vibration, proprioception from the ipsilateral leg and lower trunk. Whereas the fascicula, fasciculus cuneatus is carrying light touch, proprioception, vibration information from the ipsilateral arm and upper trunk. Together, these make up the dorsal columns. On the, uh, down here in the uh, anterior lateral quadrant of the white matter, uh, anterior lateral to clinicians, ventral lateral to, uh, to basic scientists, travels the spinal thalamus spinothalamic tract. This is also called sometimes by some people the anterior lateral system or the anterior lateral pathway. Um, I'll call it the spinothalamic tract. So this is carrying information about pain and temperature from the opposite side of the body. Finally, we have two motor pathways, and I only told you about one, and I'm going to explain the other one right now. So this is that pathway that I talked about, the corticospinal pathway, the pathway that's involved in, in um, producing voluntary movement. These are axons that started up in motor cortex on which side? Think about it, think about it, other side. Remember, they crossed at the motor decussation, right at the spinomedullary junction. 
So they start in motor cortex, they come down through the brain, they cross at the spinomedullary junction, and they come down here. And when they reach the level at which their, their motor neuron to be innervated is, they will leave this tract and they will come down here and contact a motor neuron, which will then send a, a fiber out to contract, contact a um, skeletal muscle. Okay, so this is involved in uh, this is involved in voluntary movements. Now, every voluntary movement ha you have um, various automatic movements that accompany voluntary movements. We'll go into this in great detail, but for uh, for one, uh, everything that you do is going to change the, your postural. Um, stability and so you you make sure that you're not going to fall over before you do every action and to do that you use this tract here which is carrying essentially um, automatic signals automatic commands to skeletal mu muscles uh, commands that you're not aware of um, and this is called the ventral cortical spinal tract so when information comes down from the motor cortex 90% of it crosses at the motor decussation, forms the lateral corticospinal tract. The other 10% stays on this side. It, it travels as the ventral corticospinal tract. And when it gets to the correct segment, it sends its axon to contact motor neurons on both sides. It's bilateral. So in general, um, a lesion down here may not have a strong effect because this, uh, this pathway and this pathway are both serving both sides, okay? Lesions right here are gonna have a huge effect. In the next segment, we're gonna go over some specific lesions that, and, and what their effects on um, function will be.